just a quick housekeeping note. In order to reduce the background noise, we have muted all of our attendees on our end with the exception of our presenter. And as always, there will be opportunities for you to relay your comments and your questions. Again, feel free to use the chat box in your control panel to communicate with us. And if you would like to have us unmute you because you'd like to talk over the phone, we can do that as well. Um, again, um, this session will be recorded and posted later on Basecamp because there's some of you that were not able to make the live session, so we will be doing that as well. So many of you have indicated throughout your experience in Hallways to Health that you would like to really tackle the unhealthy food landscape at your schools, but you really don't know where to start or who to talk to in order to make these changes, which is why we have this session today. And today we're going to be really focusing on best practices, particularly in the area of USDA's new Smart Snacks and School Nutrition Standards. We're going to talk about how to engage in meaningful conversations with school nutrition staff and management, and also how to, you know, how to really gain school staff and administrator buy-in to improve the total school food environment. Um, again, during this session, we're going to highlight a couple of different steps for success that are feasible, really cost-effective, and we hope it helps empower you to really navigate improving the nutrition that's offered to the students and employees at the schools where you are currently located. And so some, these are some of the learning objectives that we hope you will achieve through today's session. So we know that there are several factors that influence what and how our students in particular are consuming food while they are at school. Many of you have indicated that in terms of breakfast, even though some of your, many of your students may be eligible for free or reduced breakfast, they don't eat this meal at school. Um, many of them don't even get any sort of breakfast at their home. And some of you have indicated within your school setting you don't really have alternative breakfast options either. Um, and for those that do eat breakfast at school, you in, you, you've witnessed them not really choosing the most nutritious item, but mo more so the ones that are more appealing to their taste buds. Um, in terms of lunch, I know some of you, uh, when we did our individual site visits with you over the last spring, we saw that lunch really started at 10.30 in the morning, which is still breakfast for some students, or at least in their mind. Um, so students are more likely to skip lunch. Um, for those of you that, you know, see adolescent age groups, they sometimes they don't, skip, they don't eat lunch at all. They'd rather socialize with their friends or they forego lunch and eat outside of the school, maybe after school at the local corner store or carry out. Um, if they do eat any sort of food during lunchtime, it may not be through what the cafeteria offers, but it might be just a snack, a quick snack at the vending machine. So again, you know, lunch is not really consistently eaten at the same time, or the options are not usually um, available to a lot of students, or sometimes students, they have different patterns of how they, how and what they eat for lunch during the school day. And many of you have indicated, you know, a lot of these different uh, behavioral patterns to us. And then outside of breakfast and lunch, when we talk about rewards and fundraisers and a lot of those holiday parties or, you know, celebrations, you know, what do we mostly see being offered? It's either something very sugar-laden, something that's very, you know, nutritionally deficient, not very high in nutritional value. And a lot of times it's not necessarily the students that are offering um, these rewards or, you know, these options for their fundraisers, but it might be school staff. So how do you get around that delicate conversation with school staff to let them know that there are, you know, different options to, for fundraisers or to reward students that, you know, don't have to include necessary food or don't have to include a lot of non-nutritional food items? So we understand that this is a challenge for you for many of your school-based health centers. Um, many of you do know, you know, what are the eating patterns of the students within your particular school building. You've, you know, you've relayed that information to us, and you've, some of you have tried to relay that information to teachers and administrators as well. And we understand that sometimes many of the teachers right now are trying to really have some good messaging behind various health promotion educational activities within the context of hallways to health. However, you know that sometimes you may be advocating for healthy food options, but the food environment, you know, the environment at the school is not offering the best food options to support the, these, mes the, these messages. So we understand that. Um, and many of you mentioned that you as providers or staff within the school-based health center, you may not feel really empowered to facilitate these changes. Sometimes these changes go beyond your authority or, with, you know, or even with 
beyond the school itself. So you, you don't really know how to navigate um, what are those connections or you know, how to start those conversations or with whom in order to really see these changes come forward. So you know, we understand that this is a challenge for you, and we hope that today's session does shed some light um, on this, you know, this particular um, area in terms of trying to change the blue landscape, which we understand is a challenge. So as I mentioned, we, you know, we are always encouraging participation from you. If you would like to be unmuted throughout any part of the presentation, just let us know. You can use the chat box on your control panel um, to let, let us know that, or you can raise your hand. Also, you can use the chat box to answer any questions that we, you know, we may present to you as a group, or if you have any comments that you want to relate to, you know, our, the presenter today, or to the rest of the participants on the call. So please, you know, you're always encouraged to share your 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 thoughts or your questions throughout the presentation. And I'd like to introduce our guest presenter today. <clears throat> today, we are very um, happy to have Stephanie Joyce from the Alliance for Healthier Generation. Stephanie is the National Nutrition Advisor with the Alliance, specializing, specializing in assisting schools and out-of-school time sites successfully implement healthier meals and snacks nationwide. Stephanie holds a Bachelor of Science degree in Food Science and Human Nutrition from the University of Maine and a Master of Science degree in Public Health Nutrition from the University of Tennessee. And prior to joining the Alliance for Healthier Generation, Stephanie worked for a public school district in rural Maine first in the coordinated school health model and eventually moving into school nutrition, most recently serving as a school nutrition director for the Yarmouth School District. And without further ado, we'd like to turn it over to Stephanie. Welcome, Stephanie, and we're going to go ahead and, and make you the presenter so that you can share your slides with us. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Let me uh, just pull my screen up here, and if you can just let me know when you can all see it. All right, how does that look? We can see it, thanks. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for that introduction and for having me here today. I'm really excited um, to be speaking with you all. Um, like Eliana mentioned, my roots go back to working in coordinated school health, and so this is one of my areas I'm really passionate about. And, you know, working with school-based health centers, is you guys understand this work well. You know that um, student health is not just impacted by what they eat, it's not just by how regular they move, the health care they receive, it's all of those social, emotional, and physical needs being met, and that it, you really need a targeted approach to make this work happen. Um, childhood obesity is something that's, you know, been a hot topic for a number of years now, and the Alliance for Healthier Generation works to help reduce the prevalence of childhood obesity. Um, it's something that I'm sure you guys well understand. I'm sure you see a lot of students coming in your school-based health centers that you know, are, you're seeing the impact day to day of students that either maybe aren't eating breakfast at all, are, are skipping lunch, perhaps they're not eating well balanced, not getting the health care that they need. Um, there's a number of issues that I'm sure in the health centers you guys are seeing every day. And so hopefully um, by working with you all, we can at least help you work on targeting, creating healthier school food environments. So what I would like to go over today, like we already mentioned, um, but I'm going to do a quick overview of the Smart Snacks in School Nutrition Standards. And you may or may not have already heard of those. Um, hopefully you've at least heard of them, but um, you know, if you're not in the school nutrition world, I think sometimes it's easy that it doesn't get communicated beyond there, so you may not have heard of it. Um, I'm going to talk about the why, so that would be our Smart Snacks, but I really want to spend a lot of time focusing on the how. So what are some steps for success that you can all take that are practical approaches to help have these meaningful conversations with individuals and key stakeholders in your district? Um, and then also identifying who are the partners that you need to collaborate and what are the messages you need to communicate to them. Um, so I'm hoping that you may have been able to print one of the handouts that I had. Um, it was a Word document, and I think it just said a uh, handout for School-Based Health Alliance. But if you want to um, have that out in front of you, it's not critical that you have it, but I find it helpful to just um, guide you throughout our conversations today. Um, please feel free to take lots of notes. And I don't, Ileana, if you don't mind monitoring the chat box and just kind of interrupting me if you have any pertinent questions um, related to what I'm talking to, we can answer those as we go. 
Sure. So um, as for those of you who are on the call, I'm not sure if you're able to see on your control panel, but there is a tab that says materials. And it should, there should be three documents. Um, if you are able to access those documents, um, you can, again, as Stephanie mentioned, there is a Word document that's um, noted as Smart Snacks, the basics. Again, it should be um, a link under the Materials tab on your control panel on your right-hand side. If you're unable to access it, that's OK. We'll, we will post these worksheets afterwards. But if you can download or if you, if you want to click on that link under the Materials tab, then you can follow along with Stephanie as she goes through that document. Great. Thank you so much. So I'd like to give you a quick overview on are you guys seeing this on your screen? Are you see, seeing the slideshow? I'm not sure yeah. what's happening. Yeah. There we go. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, so I'd like to get, start with a quick history on the, the world of competitive foods and beverages and how we came to be where it is today. So back in 2004, the Child Nutrition Reauthorization Act that was passed by Congress created the first time that schools had to have a local wellness policy. In 2006, the Alliance released um, guidelines for competitive foods and beverages, which really um, was the first to be released of its kind. The following year, the Institute of Medicine um, released a report summarizing findings that they had um, related to recommendations that national standards set. So it wasn't until three years later when the Healthy and Hunger-Free Kids Act, when um, First Lady Michelle Obama came into place, one of her big things that she wanted to do was to be a champion for children's health. Um, in particular, and how it relates to schools and communities, and revising school nutrition guidelines, um, which was really, you know, unprecedented because these guidelines had not been revised in a number of years, and the current standards that had been set in place before this um, really just left a lot to be desired. And so it was really instrumental that this work happened. Um, and so that's where you saw that the school nutrition programs had a change in the meal pattern that they have to follow for school breakfast program and the lunch program. Um, so you've probably heard that they have to offer more whole grains, lower sodium. They have to offer more fruits and vegetables, so more variety in addition to higher quantities of both. Um, and one of the biggest things that I think was communicated out, um, and I'm sure you've all seen it in the news, but students have to take a fruit or vegetable with every meal. Um, a lot of folks might identify that as a waste. And I think that's where you have seen um, a lot in the news. People are saying it's increasing waste for school nutrition programs. But that is not the intention. The intention is that it exposes kids to fruits and vegetables that they should be consuming because of the nutrients and trying to get kids to at least accept them by slowly being exposed to it over time. So most recently in 2013 is where they released the Smart Snacks and School Nutrition Standards. And so those are standards that impact all the foods outside of the school meal programs. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more here in a minute about that. Um, but those went into effect on July 1st of 2014, so this past July. Um, so it's something that schools should have already been started um, when you came back to school this fall. However, um, you know, I, I definitely think it's, it's not something that every school has um, you know, instantly complied with. I think that it's been a shift towards finding products that meet availability um, and finding products that are compliant with the SNAP. So hopefully your school is working on it um, if they've not already started or fully implemented it already. So to review what these products um, or what these Smart Snacks nutrition guidelines impact, they will cover all foods and beverages that are sold to students outside of the breakfast and lunch program. It encompasses the entire school day, which is defined as midnight until 30 minutes after the school day ends. So if your school bell rings at, uh, say, 2 o'clock p.m., they have to follow Smart Snacks until 2.30 p.m. It covers all foods, that are foods and beverages that are on the school campus. But it does not cover any foods that are served. So say it's like they had a, cel a birthday celebration, for example. They're not selling that cupcake to kids. So it doesn't impact that. It also doesn't impact um, <clears throat> opportunities for events, evenings or weekends or community events. So if there's any, like, say, a basketball game happening on school grounds and the athletic boosters have a concession stand, 
it's 30 minutes after school day, it's open to the public, that would not be impacted by Smart Snacks. So just as a quick review, and this is also on the handout if you have it in front of you to fill in the blanks. So Smart Snacks in School covers all foods and beverages sold on the school campus during the school day. So those are the biggest things. It has to be foods that are sold to students. So if you have, um, say, a vending machine that is only in a teacher's lounge and it's on the school campus, it's sold during the school day, but only teachers have access to it, this would not impact them. So what types of venues are being impacted by smart snacks in schools? So the foods and beverages that are offered in vending machines, school stores, snack carts, anything sold a la carte. So if you walk into your school cafeteria, they'll, you know, say there's the, the line where they're serving the main entree, the, you know, the typical hot lunch that everyone refers to it as. Um, they may have some carts off to the side that sell like snack items, maybe some chips, granola bars, trail mix, different things like that. That's what you consider your a la carte item. So it impacts everything um, sold in those areas. So before implementing these or exploring these standards, it's really important to note that these are only set as a minimum. So if your state or your school district sets more rigorous standards, those would take precedence. So whichever is more rigorous is what your district needs to follow. Um, smart snacks is just a minimum that must be met. Um, and as the alliance, we actually recommend that schools consider moving this uh, standard to not just foods that are sold, so also um, moving it towards applying to other areas that might be impacted. So say, um, you know, your, your celebrations, your food is rewards. Encouraging your staff meetings, any foods that are sold or served to staff, also getting staff to role model and participate in meeting these guidelines. Um, it's really important for us to think about moving these guidelines to the entire school food environment. And the last one that I want to mention um, that I haven't said already is fundraising. So how does this impact fundraising? Um, it also impacts fundraising if these fundraisers include food, are sold to students, are on the school campus, and during the school day. So if any student groups in your school district previously sold, um, let's say, for example, like Valentine's Day is coming up, um, have any of your schools maybe sold like a little candy gram, they have like little candy attached to a Valentine or something, um, I've seen that be a popular um, fundraiser in schools. If that particular candy does not meet the smart snack standards, they are no longer allowed to sell that during the school day. So what are some of the healthier items that we're seeing replace um, some of the existing foods that are being sold? So we're seeing a lot of um, more water, juice, and milk, which is great. More whole grain items like popcorn, crackers, baked chips, fresh fruits and veggies. Um, we've also seen a lot of smoothies, and you'll see roll-ups there. Those are actually whole grain um, wrap roll-ups that are cut up into pinwheels. But there are so many great choices that can be out there, and so we're glad to see more um, of these foods being offered to students. So um, there's one of the handouts that I offered was, uh, it, the title was Infographic, but it's this document that you'll see here. But it's a great visual representation that the USDA has put out that shows the change of the number of empty calories that were previously offered to students before the new standards and then after the new standards. So you'll see that the standards focus on giving the kids more nutrient-dense food items, which is so important. So I'm not going to go into great detail on the guidelines because um, there are a lot of handouts. There's one included here um, that I'll also mention here in a moment um, that goes into these into greater detail. But I do want to make sure that you have a good understanding of an overview. So basically, the foods have to meet one of these general standards before they can be placed into the, the, the next layer of uh, vetting which is, do they meet specific nutrient standards? So in order to first be um, vetted to this initial criteria, it has to meet one of these four colored boxes on the screen. It either needs to be a whole grain item, well, the first ingredient either needs to be a fruit, vegetable, dairy product, or a protein food. 
The other option is that it could be a combination food that includes a quarter cup of fruit and or vegetable. Or the last one could be that it contains at least 10% daily value of certain nutrients. And so these are nutrients of public health concern that were identified in the 2010 dietary guidelines. And those include calcium, potassium, vitamin D, and dietary fiber. So this last one in the blue box about the 10% of daily value, we really discourage schools from using because this particular standard is going to become obsolete July 1, 2016. They offered it initially to allow some flexibility for schools to move towards, you know, if they did have products that at least met that, it would help them have a two-year period where they could kind of phase those products out until these products are reformulated to meet the other three criteria. But we discourage schools from using it only because um, eventually they're no longer be able to use the standard. So if you have a product that meets at least one of these standards that are just outlined, then you can use that nutrition information off of the food label to determine if it meets all the following um, nutrition standards. So the third handout that I had posted on uh, under the materials, you'll see it's a US, another USDA material item, but it's Smart Snacks in School, All Foods Sold in School Standards. So it basically gives you a great bulleted list of the standards that these products must meet. It shows the first um, four criteria that I just mentioned. So they have to meet at least one of those. And then it gives you the particular uh, nutrient requirements that will address calories, sodium, fat, and sugar. On the second item, it goes into deeper um, detail on the beverages, which I'll go over in just a minute. So some of the foods are exempt from these standards, foods that we know are good for kids. So anything that's any fresh, um, so some of the fresh canned or frozen fruits and veggies are exempt. They now have calorie limits, which is something that was not um, in place before. And they have specific calorie limits, one, if the item is either a snack or a side item. And then they have different um, calorie limits for entree items, so allowing greater flexibility if it's an entree, say for example, like a slice of pizza. There are now fat limits in place, which include fat limits for total fat, saturated fat, and trans fat. It's important to note for the trans fat, they um, have zero grams of fat is the limit. For sugar, oops, sorry. <laughs> so for sugar, they've also had um, less than 30% of the weight from total sugars can be in these foods. And for sodium, they also have limits. Um, they have specific ones for snacks and sides, and then separate ones for entrees. And it's important to note that those are going to be reduced in another two years. Now, moving on to beverages. Beverages um, have some variation for different grade levels. So while the nutrient standards I just went over for all the foods is the same for K-12, they have different um, requirements for each of the age levels in um, beverage components. So for all grades, all grades are allowed to serve water, so with or without carbonation. Non-fat milk, plain or flavored. Low-fat milk, they can only serve plain. They can serve 100% fruit or vegetable juice with no added sweeteners or 100% fruit or vegetable juice diluted with water. And that can be with or without carbonation. However, there are serving size limits. So for elementary schools, they cannot, they have to keep the minimum, I'm sorry, they have to keep the limit to eight ounces. And for middle school and high school, they have to keep it to 12 ounces. Now for high school, there's a little bit more flexibility. For high school, they can also serve diet beverages. So that would be up to 20 ounces and for lower calorie beverages. And you can see that the same written on the second page of that USC handout that I mentioned, but it greater less than or equal to 40 calories for 8 ounces or less than or equal to 60 calories for 12 ounces. One of the other things I really want to mention is that no caffeinated beverages will be allowed at elementary and middle school. 
So to show you some venues that would be impacted by Smart Snacks, so this here looks like a school store and a snack bar that they have in their school. Those would apply. Any foods that are being sold there during the school day to students on school campus would apply. Here we have a picture of some youth. It looks like they've got their baseball gear on, so they're after school. And uh, it looks like they might not be on school grounds, so that would not be impacted by smart tax. This next picture looks like they're doing a fundraising event. Looks like a bake sale they've got going on. They're selling to students on school campus. So that would be impacted by smart tax. Now let's take a look at some items that may or may not be meeting smart tax. So here we get some baked chips, some pop chips. Those are acceptable items in smart snacks. So how about baked goods? What do you guys think on those? So these brownies are likely not applying to smart snacks. Um, it is possible that they may, depending on what their ingredients are and what the nutrition label is. Um, but generally speaking, we're finding that baked goods are not um, meeting smart snacks. Popcorn is a really popular one we've seen in a lot of different places. This is likely meeting. It is a whole grain, which is great, but sometimes we've been finding that it exceeds on the sodium or perhaps on the fat with the oil that they're cooking with. Um, but I've been working with a lot of people to help them modify their recipes so that it can meet smart snacks. Fruit snacks, those are really popular amongst the kids. And these ones likely do not meet. It's possible they may, depending on their ingredients and the nutrition label. However, most of the time we're seeing that they do not meet. Here's some fresh fruits and veggies. This is an easy one. Those are a definite yes. And some diet um, soft drinks that we have here. These do meet, however, only at the high school level. Here we've got lots of bottled water. Those are a yes. And sports drinks are really popular among youth, too. And those, however, do not meet. So now I'd like to get into how you guys can get started with supporting your schools and smart snacks. Are there any questions so far on things that I've, on anything we've covered so far? Um, so Stephanie, no one has yet to post a question in the chat box. But um, I just wanted to kind of recap on some things you touched base on touched based on. Um, it's really interesting that you included the school store in that or you meant that the school store is included because I know some of the some of our sites that are current some of our school based health centers are servicing high school students. They indicate that a lot of the students they work at the school store, but that they're kind of selling a lot of the they, as, as of last year they were selling a lot of those, you know, um, popular snacks such as chips and fruit snacks and sodas and so forth. So it's really interesting that, that venue is now going to be affected by these um, smart snacks guidelines. Um, so again, that's some, an opportunity for them to kind of, because they, they mentioned last year that they wanted to change it because they felt that it was, you know, contradicting a lot of the healthy messaging, but now it seems like there is a policy or some sort of mandate that includes them in that environment as well. Yeah, absolutely. Unless they're serving, unless they're selling after that 30 minute period after the end of the school day. So, and one of the reasons why they define the school day as midnight is because it's the start of the school day because they didn't want school stores and other venues selling before school starts. So yeah, it's definitely an area that's also going to be impacted. So I will continue on and feel free to type any questions you have as we go. So one of the things to get started, we want to make sure that you need to get organized. And so we have created a bunch of tools to help you through this process. Um, you know, first out, obviously, you need to figure out where your, your snacks and beverages are being sold and what groups are responsible. So knowing what venues you have. You also need to understand what products do you have out there. Um, you know, I've seen so many schools with, you know, every organization, oh, the vending machines are each owned by someone different. You know, there's the school store, the snack carts, the fundraisers. Um, it's definitely a very large animal to get a hold, to wrangle in and to get your hands on. But um, hopefully, we've created some tools that can help you get organized through that process. Um, and I'll walk you through those here in a minute. 
um, you really want to talk to the groups that are responsible for these different venues and try to build consensus. So, you know, letting them know that you're there to help and that you have some tools to help them walk through this process so it doesn't have to feel so overwhelming. Um, you know, encouraging them, validating that it can feel overwhelming, that they're not alone, that schools across the U.S., other school, other organizations within your school are working towards this. Your school nutrition program is working on this. Um, so it's definitely something that you guys can tackle together. Um, and then once you start to take a look at your products, you can begin to work with those that are responsible for the contract and contacting vendors to find compliant products. So we have developed a Smart Snacks Toolkit. And this is a step-by-step -step guide to help we implement Smart Snacks in your school. So it ha takes you through different steps that will, of the things that I just mentioned, getting to know your venues, getting others involved, um, you know, how to work through those working with contracts and vendors, how to find compliant products. Um, we've developed a lot of tools um, that, you know, I'll mention here when we go through these in a moment, but um, we have a Smart Snacks product calculator that you might have already seen, our Smart Snacks product navigator. Um, these tools allow you to browse through products that we've already put through a vetting process to see whether or not they meet Smart Snacks, so that's a great resource. But also the product calculator, there are thousands of products out there. Um, not everyone is listed in our product calculator, and there may be products out there that are not in our, excuse me, they're not in our navigator, but are still compliant. So the product calculator allows you to select what your product is. You can answer a few simple questions on, uh, in terms of what's in the ingredient statement, and it will help you determine if your product is compliant. Here are a few um, screenshots of the venue survey tools that we have, so we'll help um, help you all get organized. You know, this is a really great opportunity to get youth involved and get them to take the lead on some of this. If you have um, either a student council, if there's a student health um, advisory committee, a school nutrition advisory committee, anything like that. Um, if you have youth that are interested in the healthcare field or um, interested in nutrition and they want to, you know, looking for a project or volunteer hours, this would be great to get them involved so they can actually organize okay, where are all the areas in the school that we are selling foods or beverages? And then once they've identified those venues, they ha we have food and beverage inventory, so they can actually go down and take pictures or um, you know, write down, here's the beverage I found. It's in a 20-ounce serving. I couldn't find it in the product navigator, but I did collect the nutrition label. Um, I actually take my smart, when I was working in schools, I took my smartphone around, and I just took pictures of nutrition labels and then I went back to my desk, uploaded it all, and then I went through and put it into the calculator. So um, kids have smartphones. They love putting them to good use. So this would be one of those ways. And you can quickly collect all that nutrition labels in just a few snaps of your phone. So we have developed um, several communication tools that you can use. We want, you to help, we want to help you spread the word on what Smart Snacks is, why it's important, and why we're all doing this work. So we have created some sample um, social media posts that you can put either on your district website or district um, Facebook or Twitter account if you have one. Um, we have folks um, that have helped us design pieces that you can put on your website or new parent newsletters or if you want to um, we have some sample morning announcements that we've had a lot of kids enjoy reading, which is great because kids love to listen to their own peers, hopefully. Um, so letting kids read these morning announcements. We also have some sample PowerPoint presentations on there and videos on demand that you can actually use if you want to um, take it to an administrative team meeting or to a parent group um, to help communicate why Smart Snacks is happening and what it means. We also have um, some suggested ways that you can engage youth. So taste testing events, um, hosting school focus groups. Um, we have some prompts that you can like print some of these pages off and it'll give some suggested ideas and ways that you can make this work happen. Here is the Smart Snacks product calculator that I, was, uh, that I mentioned earlier. Um, but it really takes the guesswork out of the standards for you. So you don't have to be sitting around there with your calculator trying to figure out the math. You can just enter the information straight off the product um, itself and enter it into our screen and 
you know, hit the next button and it's going to tell you whether or not it means. Um, one of the important things I like to mention to folks is that um, it mentions it in the top left hand corner here, but you need to enter your product information per amount sold. So the guidelines are written as, the, as each item is packaged. So you need to make sure that your servings, if it says that there are two servings per container, you need to do that math before entering it into the calculator. You would need to make sure that you are multiplying it by two to represent that it has two servings in that one container. So in order to do use the product calculator, the things that you're going to want, you need the ingredient statement, and you need the nutrition label. Like I said, taking it around with your smartphone is a very simple way to do this. Um, it's going to ask you, um, if it's a snack item, what the first ingredient is. And here you can see um, the first one is dried potatoes. It's also going to want some of the information, the calories, the fat, sodium, um, that's listed on the nutrition label. And then this is a sample um, serving for uh, beverages. And that one, you can see it says servings per container, about two. So you need to make sure that that um, math is being done before you enter it. The product calculator is the second most popular tool that we have. Um, you can browse uh, products that already meet the standards, like I mentioned. Um, and one of the things I love about this, when I was a school nutrition director, I would have, say if I had a chip product, I remember chips was a difficult one. We sold a lot of them. They, um, the ones we were using were not going to meet smart snacks. So I was able to go into the product navigator and search under chip products and find acceptable chips. So I could find um, a substitute that was similar, which is nice, because you don't want to just replace chips with carrot sticks, for example, because it's not in the same snack category. You know, you're looking for something savory and crunchy. That's what your customers are asking for. And so you want to find a similar um, product for replacement. We have a lot of success stories on our website. So, um, if you go to visit our Swap Your Snacks page, and you can see that map in the bottom right, but all these little blue dots represent success stories. And I find that's really helpful when communicating to um, school personnel, just because people want to hear like, okay, that's fine for, you know, I know you say it's going to work, but how do I know? Well, we have highlighted some success stories of schools that have already done this work and been successful doing it. And so we've written up um, you know, how they've been able to do it and the celebration that they've had. Um, so I really recommend that you check that piece out. So I would love for you to take just a moment to um, jot down, it says one, two, three on that handout, but I want you to write down who do you think needs to know about the changes that are happening uh, foods and beverages in your school. And if a few of you either want to type your answers into the chat box or um, I'm not sure if folks can come off mute or raise their hand, but I would love to hear from you guys who do you think needs to be aware of this stuff that may or may not already know. So if you don't want to be unmuted, um, please go ahead and list those folks that you feel need to be informed about these um, foods and beverages sold in the chat box. So go ahead and do that. Um, Stephanie, just, you want to list about three, correct? Yeah. Um, well, I mean, one to three, whatever, even just a few most important people. I'd love to see what folks are thinking. Okay, so everyone on the call, just take about you know, a few seconds and type in the chat box who you feel needs to know about the changes to food and beverages that are sold on school campus. I see students, parents, teachers, definitely. I like that students were listed first on that one because sometimes they're the last to find out, right? Any others? School administration, parents, teachers, students. How about the school-based health centers? <laughs> yes, yeah, absolutely. PTA, very good, yep. Yes, school-based health centers, nice. Good. Well, that's awesome. Well, I hope you're having, maybe you guys are having some conversations at your sites right now and just jotting down these notes. Um, right now, I would like to move into how do we partner with those individuals and those key stakeholders that need to know. 
So that one's cafeteria staff, awesome, definitely youth, cool. So um, what, what are some things that we need to think about when we're talking to key stakeholders that need to be informed of this work? So I want us to, to talk a little bit more about why is it important to them, what's relevant to them, and what do they need to know? So I really want us to focus here on how can we speak their language, because everyone's going to hear your message more when you're talking their talk. How to understand what their priorities are. So if we can think about what we know is on the top of their priority list, and then how can we reframe our message so that it kind of matches what they're going to be tuned into, what are their ears going to be turned on for. So who are our partners for collaboration? So I'm hoping that I can provide some tips on how to talk with the individuals that we're going to list here. So one of the ones that you all mentioned is cafeteria staff, absolutely. So they are likely already doing this work because they had to start this work July 1st. Um, and they sell a lot of competitive foods, particularly at middle school and high school. You see it less so at elementary school. Um, but definitely at high school, there's significant amounts. Um, they really need your support, and they need champions to help communicate this work. Because I'll tell you, from coming from the school nutrition world, it can be very isolating from the rest of the school district. Um, you guys might feel that way being in a school-based health center, because although you're housed in the schools, um, technically, you know, you may or may not be, um, you know, considered a part of that, you know, like teaching staff. And so sometimes you can feel like you're trying to, you know, break into this this group to communicate the, the work that you're doing. And school nutrition is the same way. Um, so I really want to communicate how important it is to, to let them know what can I do to help. Like ask them, what could you, what could you do that would help support them in their work? Um, so they likely need a lot of help communicating this work to the areas outside of school nutrition. So more than likely, they've either got this work covered or they're working on it on their radar. They're working with vendors and distributors to try to get compliant products in. But for some school nutrition directors, to begin to even think about tackling this work in the areas that are outside of their school nutrition program is very daunting. So the fundraisers, the, the snack carts, the school stores, all the student organization groups that are happening. So like the Vending machines perhaps may not be run by your school nutrition program. Like those outside areas, I'm going to guess is an area they could use a lot of your support in. One other thing is really important um, to keep in mind, and you may or may not be aware of this already, but many school nutrition programs are expected to be self-operating. So that means that they have to self-sustain their own budget. So generally speaking, school nutrition programs are usually not included in the school's local district budget. So the school district might give them a chunk of change to help subsidize their program. But generally speaking, most school nutrition programs are expected to be self-operating in the sense that they have their own budget, and they are expected to break even by the end of the year, if not create revenue. When they can increase participation in their school nutrition program, that increases the amount of federal reimbursement dollars that they have coming in and can increase revenue. So not only does it increase the nutrition quality, but also helps uh, their overall um, budget at the end of the year. So they're going to be really apt to want to partner with folks that want to help promote their program, find out a way to make that this work can be successful. Um, so I would definitely reach out to them and see what you can do to help them communicate that school nutrition programs offering healthier foods, and it's something we should be supportive of. Um, Especially one of the pieces that I want to mention, um, the fruit or vegetable I talked about and the plate waste. Have we seen a lot of stuff go into the trash cans? Um, you know, I've heard a lot of school staff when I was working in the schools, everyone would complain about it. And they'd say, oh, you know, Michelle Obama is making us throw, the kids throw all this food away. You know, that's not true. I would really encourage you to be supportive of your school nutrition program and to let folks know hey, it's a really great thing that they're offering the kids more fruits and vegetables, and they want the kids to be eating more and exposed to more variety. Um, and that's ultimately the purpose. Um, we want kids to be selecting fruits and vegetables that they want to eat. 
Um, so finding ways that you can help support your school nutrition program in that, and just even if you hear someone, um, you know, saying something negative about the school nutrition program, trying to reframe that message so it's positive is a huge um, supportive piece you can do. So working with administrators, that was another one that I saw you guys suggest. Um, definitely reinforcing the school nutrition message. So if you know that your school nutrition program director has already been trying to have conversations with the principal, um, assistant principal, you know, just reinforcing those same messages. And letting them know, too, that even um, non-compliance of, of these federal regulations, although compliance um, procedures have not been formally set yet, they could possibly jeopardize funding for the school nutrition program. So if schools lose any of their funding that they're getting for federal reimbursement, that could mean that the school nutrition program is in a deficit. And if that happens, um, the school district does have to subsidize that. So that money is going to have to come from somewhere. Um, and you really don't want to see um, any of the school nutrition dollars that, are, dollars that are being put into that program take away from curriculum and programming. The other piece, too, that's important to keep in mind that the higher participation in free and reduced um, meal programs also helps your Title I funding that the principals are likely, um, you know, have an eye on. And so making sure that they understand that um, the more they can support a quality nutrition program, it's going to support their, their curriculum and programming in other ways. I would also talk to your administrators about ways that you can help get parents and youth buy-in, because they probably are hearing a lot from parents, either positive or negative, on these regulations and helping them to figure out how they can regulate and find compliant fundraisers. Because I'm sure there is an administrator that is watching to see and approving different fundraisers that are happening during the school day. So it may or may not be your principal, it might be an athletic director, it could be another individual that's been appointed to this in your district. Um, but I remember in the schools they had to get an approval form filled out for fundraisers. So maybe you could say to them, hey, I would love to help figure out how we can make sure that smart snacks is being implemented correctly with fundraisers. Can I help you know, with that form? Can I help educate groups on how to do compliant fundraisers, where they can find compliant products, that sort of thing? Um, and then I also think administrators would be really interested to see some of the communication pieces that I went over that are on our smart snacks toolkit page. So if your district has like a social media page or if they have a marketing um, if they're doing any marketing or communication, parent newsletters, things like that, making sure that administrators have access to that is great. The next one, teachers. We had a lot of folks mention teachers when I had you all type into the chat box. Um, teachers are likely those advisors. They're those individuals that are helping to support student groups. Um, they also are probably doing fundraising within their own classrooms. They're fine probably field trips. We've all seen budget cuts. and so. Um, schools are becoming more dependent on fundraising. So making sure that, you know, um, that your teachers understand that they still have to be compliant with smart facts and what, what that means. There's also the opportunity to address foods as rewards and celebrations in the classroom. So letting your teachers know that this is something that is happening for smart snacks, so foods that are served, at, or I'm sorry, foods that are sold to students, but it's also considered a best practice to take those guidelines and move it to also encompass foods that are served. So that would be your foods as rewards and celebrations. On our Alliance website, we have a resource database, and it actually shows, um, we have some handouts that have sample rewards that people can use at either low cost or free, um, pencils, stickers, ideas on you know homework passes, things like that that you can still look forward to but being rewarded in a healthy way. We also have resources on our website like sample letters, so letters that teachers can print off and modify to like either send them to parents about healthy snacks, um, sample healthy snack lists, um, letters that a teacher could leave for their substitute teacher to say, you know, hey, in my classroom we actually only healthy rewards, so while you're here while I'm out, could you please respect that um, in giving them some suggestions. And then definitely I think the swap your snack page that I mentioned with the map. Um, in the blue dots that highlight success stories is important. So identifying parents. 
as a, a key stakeholder was definitely, um, I saw a couple folks mention parents, too, um, in the chat box. Parents want to be told why things are changing. They don't want to just see that things are changing or feel like this stuff is being imposed on their child. So when speaking to parents, really try to frame the message on how it will benefit their child and why we think it's a good thing. Um, I think parents are also usually pretty eager to help out. Um, they really want to know what they can do to support this work. So letting them know the ways that you think that they could be helpful. So I would you know, probably get, begin by suggesting to parents that they're supportive of this work and not to criticize the school nutrition program and not to criticize, you know, smart snacks and the regulations. Um, but if they do have questions, letting them know that, you know, you'd be happy to point them to some resources or you'd be happy to answer any questions. Um, and then parents also want to hear, like, your parent groups are probably doing a lot of uh, fundraisers that bring in quite a bit of money. So they don't want to just hear that they shouldn't be doing, you know, X, Y, Z for a fundraiser. They want to know, what could I do for a fundraiser? So trying to not just tell them what they can't do, but show them what they can do. Um, we also have um, a handout on healthy fundraisers with some ideas on ways that people can fundraise without using food. And the same goes for rewards and celebrations. So the more you can connect with your PTO group, um, PTA, and just letting them know that you're there for support and focusing your messages on, well, here's what you should do, not here's what you can't do. And then most importantly, I would say getting your key stakeholders, um, your kids are your key, key stakeholders in getting, being successful in this work. So making sure that you have their customer approval. So both when you're making changes as well as once the changes have been made, you really want to keep students and staff informed of what's going on and why. Um, and engage students when it's possible to find out what their preference is. Um, they're the ultimate customers, and they help keep revenue up, specifically in the school nutrition program. So it's important to let them know what's going on, incorporating their feedback, and making sure that we promote, promote, promote. Um, learning ways um, or learning about youth preferences and incorporating those into snacks and meals at school nutrition programs is really important. Um, and we have some suggested ways on our website um, that you might be able to seek student feedback. So posting taste testing, um, so maybe bring, you can get free samples from vendors all the time that are selling um, smart snack compliant products. They'll drop stuff off and you can taste test the kids and see what they like. Um, doing nutrition education in the classroom, you know, I'm sure you guys are rather busy, so whether or not it's you or someone else in the school district, um, perhaps even the school nutrition um, personnel, they might be able to do nutrition ed in the classroom. Um, even offering kitchen tours of the, of the school nutrition program is a really great activity that the kids enjoy and they can um, value the program more. Doing student surveys to gauge their um, level of interest in certain products or how they would want things communicated and promoted amongst them. Having kids help do the inventory list, like I mentioned, doing the venue um, inventory to see where all these foods are being sold. You could also have kids create a marketing plan to promote this work. Um, and consider showing the students what the navigator, the product navigator and the product calculator is, because um, kids are very smart, and I think they would learn how to do the calculator very easily and could help you guys with some of this legwork, and it's a great opportunity for them to learn as well. So one thing I want to remind you all is that this work is a marathon. It's not a sprint. You're in it for the long haul, so don't be discouraged if it doesn't happen overnight because it's not going to happen overnight. Um, but I think the more you can keep the messages positive when you're trying to facilitate change, but also when you hear people maybe say something negative about them, um, reframing that message and trying to get folks to think about what the positive of this work is. Um, so I'd love to, for you to take just, you know, maybe 30 seconds to write down on one of the last um, bullet items that I had there is what is one action item you will take after this training? And you can even think about something um, really small. It doesn't have to be large, but maybe, hey, I'm going to bring this up to my district wellness team, or I'm going to just introduce myself to the school nutrition director because I don't know who he or she is. Um, maybe you're going to reach out to your principal and see, um, what you could do to help support them. 
Maybe you're just going to visit our website and pull off some of the social media pieces and email it to whoever manages that um, for your district. So just take a couple seconds to go ahead and write that down for yourself. And if you'd like to share, feel free to post in the chat box as well in terms of what's one action item you will take with you after today's training. Yeah, absolutely. That would be great. Thank you. So someone wrote, uh, Mandy wrote, draft and promote a smart tech policy throughout the school and get leadership approval. Visit the website for ideas, definitely. Cool. Um, Mandy, I want to mention, and actually I could probably sell it and send out an email too after Ileana if you can get this out to folks, but we have a new model wellness policy that we've just um, released a month ago on the Alliance website. I didn't include the direct link on this presentation, so maybe I can email that to you. But it actually includes language, language on smart tax and the new USDA meal pattern. So you could even, it's in a Word document, so you can edit it or you could copy it and if your district likes the way it is, you could approve it as is. Um, but it will give you a starting point at least. Okay, that would be terrific. We can definitely disseminate that to um, our participants and also post on our base camp page as well. Well, and I'll, um, I saw someone else post on the rewards piece, so I'll send the direct links to our rewards and celebration resources, too. Cool. Terrific. Thanks. Good. All right. Well, I'm going to wrap up here in just a moment, but I wanted to send you the website um, so where you can find our Smart Snacks resources. So it's healthiergeneration.org forward slash Smart Snacks. You can check out our food, food tools. It will be on that Smart Snacks page, so the calculator and the product navigator, like I mentioned, are the two most popular. And then also you can um, see our Smart Snacks um, resources, so like the venue survey tools and some of the on-demand videos, the PowerPoints you can use, those are all listed on this one page. And my at email address is listed here, so please feel free to email me. And, um, you know, we... I am one of three nutrition advisors at the Alliance, um, and we're here to answer any questions from schools or any individuals from the community. If you run into a hiccup trying to, if you have a recipe and you don't know how to analyze it, or if you're running into trouble using the calculator, like you can send us that nutrition information, and we are um, happy to help you go through walking through those steps and analyzing it with you. But thank you so much for having me today. Thank you so much, Stephanie. Um, again, and again, we will, um, just a few items before we wrap up. I know we don't have time for additional Q&A. So um, just a few reminders. Uh, we will post an archived version of today's session on Basecamp. And also, please take about two minutes to complete the very brief evaluation survey. The survey is going to generate automatically on your screen when you exit today's session. And we'll also send up a, a follow-up email to you in case you aren't able to complete it immediately. Um, again, and also there are some review, some tools that were presented in today's session that we will post on Basecamp for your reference as well. Um, and also think about going back to your improvement plans and looking at if there are some ways to integrate some of the strategies and ideas that Stephanie discussed today and to, to begin, and the key word is begin changing your food landscape. We know it won't um, happen overnight. Uh, Stephanie, I want to reiterate some uh, few items that you mentioned. I think it's a, a great suggestion to get the youth involved, particularly with the inventory survey tool. Most of our school-based health centers, they have youth advisory councils, and a lot of their councils have been um, very, very integral in carrying out a lot of the hallways to health activities and interventions. So I think having the youth become involved and take ownership of their food landscape by helping with the inventory, the inventory survey tool is an excellent suggestion. I think it takes the burden off the school-based health center and also the school nutrition staff to do so. Um, I think that the notion about approaching the school nutrition staff and that they will be welcome to anybody who's willing to help uh, share the messaging or disseminate some of these best practices is very important. I think some of our school-based health centers may have felt intimidated about approaching them at first or maybe felt it wasn't in their place. But I think knowing that they would welcome, you know, that added resource and um, alliance, again, within the school to help promote these messages beyond, um, you know, to different audiences, I think is very helpful for our school-based health centers to know. So I do appreciate uh, those particular suggestions that you mentioned as well. And again, um, 
it. I'll send, I'll send that resource out to you and you can forward it to the group. Okay, that would be great. Thanks again. And again, as I mentioned, we will post all the archives of today's session on Basecamp probably within the next 24 hours for your reference. And I'd like to thank everyone for joining us today. And a special thank you to Stephanie. Um, we have included her contact information in the slides if you have any additional questions. And also, p please feel free, for those of you on the call, to relay other questions that you may have to your state Hallways to Health project lead. Thanks, everybody. Have a great and happy, healthy day.